Club. Good morning and welcome to another Hips Brown Bag. Um, today, I, Lee Phillips and Joanne Murphy will be talking about course-based undergraduate research experiences in Minerva's academic curriculum, HIPS and the MAC. So we're gonna begin with a, a video, a testimonial, if you will, of, uh, of a faculty member who has incorporated a HIPS, I um, mean, a cure, excuse me, into one of her classes. And, uh, and then we'll talk about the characteristics of HIPS in the early years and then wrap up with uh, a brief discussion. So with that, I'll share this video. Hi everyone, I'm Karen Weiler from the English department. I'm sorry that I'm not able to be with you here today. Uh, I have a class that meets at the exact same time as this workshop. But I promised Joanne that I would talk about a class that I developed a research project for as part of the Mellon Grant that I had great success with and, and uh, I think it's been really transformative in my own teaching practices. So this assignment is in an early American literature course. It's a 300 level course designed um, really with majors in mind, but that I found has been um, really popular also with students from other, other parts of the university. And so what this course tries to capture is that um, sort of amazing time period in the 18th century where we move from a scarce environment of printed materials to a proliferation of printing presses and a kind of new abundance. And this is when we see the rise of the literary magazine. So what I like to do in this assignment is to help students understand this transformation. So there's two parts to this assignment. One is that we learn to use the Spring Garden Press, which is the, um, the 19th century hand press that the library owns. And two, the other thing that we do is that we study periodicals that would have been produced on that kind of hand press. And what we're trying to do is to really understand that transformative uh, moment in American culture. So I've done this assignment uh, one time in its entirety, and that was in the fall semester before the pandemic hit. The pandemic has thrown uh, something of a monkey wrench into my plans and I've had to adapt it since. But what I'll talk about today uh, and the assignment that I'm gonna share with you is the assignment that I, I taught in pre-pandemic times and that I hope to return to in its entirety. So, this assignment is how I found it to be so transformative and what I learned from it because I've learned a lot and it took me 20 years of teaching at UNCG to really grasp that if I wanted my students to be able to embrace research and to be able to equitably embrace research what I had to do was to build research into the actual daily activities of the classroom and that may not seem like a, a stunning realization, but it was one that, uh, that, that I arrived at over a period of time and, and become deeply convinced uh, about. With the kind of student body that, that I have experienced in my classes, you know, we have many students who are adult learners. We have students who have children. We have students who commute long distances. We have students who work and have, uh, you know, pretty extensive schedules outside of the daily classroom. And so what I have found for those students to ask them to return to campus to the library, to work on group projects outside of the class, really places an undue burden on some of them. And to create a more equitable classroom, what I've done is to move all of my research projects and collaborative work into the daily activity of the classroom. And to do this, um, the, the results have been really fantastic. Um, it's encouraged collaboration, and I think that where we are now, coming out of the pandemic, the students need that collab collaboration and experiences and contact more than ever before. Um, I've also found that building in that kind of collaborative work um, where students are able to talk about their papers and their ideas and their research, even though each student's individually responsible for their paper, uh, produce much better papers in the long run. Uh, the papers were, have been just much more engaging with that kind of exchange of ideas, 
that seems to me also sort of maybe like a, more like a real world practice of, of how people uh, exchange ideas in the, in the daily workplace. So um, what I found with this assignment is that uh, this kind of in-class workshop creates more equity. Uh, it increases opportunities for collaboration and it increases, I think, the student's pleasure in research. And that is something that we don't often talk about, about the importance of pleasure in doing research and, and in gaining knowledge. And I think if you look at those photographs that I've shared with you, you see that there are students who are learning a lot and they are having really a lot of fun. Uh, that was one of my favorite classes. Uh, and I think if you talk to those students, you would also find that it was one of their favorite experiences. Uh, the final thing that I'm going to say is that this is a purely anecdotal outcome, but one of the things that I did notice is that after this class and after this really collaborative uh, work and projects that we did, I found that a lot of students were more interested in attending graduate school. And it, it might also be, you know, that this was a case where students felt like um, they were more comfortable talking to me about their aspirations because we had spent so much time talking about research and, and what it means and what research looks like in different fields. So I think this is, you know, this is the whole purpose of increasing uh, research and doing this course-based research in the humanities is so that we can diversify the student body going to graduate school and ultimately diversify uh, the teaching faculty. So if you have questions about this assignment, please feel welcome to send me an email. And with that, uh, I suppose, Joanne, did you, did you want to follow up with anything on that? Um, I did. Can you hear me? Am I on? Yes. Um, let me open up. I just want to open up the uh, PDF that Karen uh, sent so that you can actually see these uh, very happy student learners, because I think that is a huge part of um, what we miss in this experience is seeing the students be engaged. Can you all see my uh, my screen there with the students? So I, I think one of the huge differences is like between this optic and the usual optic is the sage on the stage, even in a small classroom, you've got students sitting down, very actively generating, taking notes from what the professor's saying. They're all sitting down. Sometimes let's be honest, playing on the phone, right? They're distracted because it's very hard to sit there and listen to somebody else talk. Whereas what Karen has is these active, standing up, moving, touching things for learners, for class participants. And so the full research experience in her class is a full sensorial immersion in research where they're moving around the class, they're engaged with these objects, they are creating things. And obviously this is a specific type of class, but even the collaboration and the joy the students develop talking to their peers is a shift in the community dynamics in a classroom. So um, I, one of the things I love about Karen's work is how she emphasized that collaborative work, the students, the energy of the students. And I think it's that energy that gets them much more engaged. They can see that on a scaffolded level that there's certain components of this that they can do and that they can do well and that they can do easily and it's accessible to them once that hurdle of accessibility of giving them access to it has been surpassed. And um, the other thing I'd like to talk about about Karen's one, one is that um, is the inclusivity of course-based undergraduate experience. And this is why we do integrating research into the classroom. It is to make it more um, an inclusive experience. The problem with the individual undergraduate research project um, is that people tend to select the, the best students in the class. They tend to select people who look like them, sound like them, which means there's a huge portion of the, of the student body that are not getting these research experiences that are transformative in their engagement in the class, transformative in their engagement in school, in, impacts positively their GPA, their retention, their post-graduation success, their social mobility, right? I mean, this is basically the lever that moves the stone. And um, by doing it in the classroom, as Karen realized through this process, is that's the only way we truly make with it, make it fully equitable and inclusive. And so um, I just think that's really important to reiterate for our for our faculty. Thank you, Lee. Thanks, Joanne. So next we're gonna 
move to uh, some slides and just talk about some of the basic characteristics of, uh, of course-based undergraduate research experiences. Um, so let me share my screen again. And let's see how this is gonna work. So are you seeing the slide proper? There we go. You're not seeing my notes, correct? Okay. So um, gears in the Mac or gears in Mac, I always want to put a the, but I don't think the works too well with this. So gears in Mac. Uh, so basically we'll introduce what uh, undergraduate research is uh, and then uh, talk about what cures are and their benefits. Joanne just did a really good job of articulating uh, what their benefits are in her summary of Karen's uh, work. And then we'll look at what cures look like in the first two years, what are the key characteristics of cures in the first two years. And we'll talk very briefly about scaffolding research into the curriculum. So what's undergraduate research? Well, the Council on Undergraduate Research defines it as a mentored uh, investigation or creative inquiry conducted by undergraduates that, seek, that seeks to make a scholarly or artistic contribution to knowledge. And this is a very inclusive definition uh, as I see it. I, I believe it's inclusive of, of every uh, discipline, academic discipline that, that I can I can think of. Um, what are the benefits of, of research? Well, obviously, as, uh, as those of us who are professors and instructors, when we're involved in research, of course, it keeps us intellectually stimulated and helps us make contributions to our discipline and it has the potential to enhance our ability to teach. What are the benefits to students? Well, students get a realistic understanding of, of the discipline, of deep learning. Um, they learn how to work independently as well as in teams. Uh, it helps to build tolerance, um, grit, if you will, uh, through the firsthand experiences with uh, success as well as defeat. And it has the potential, uh, I believe as, as Karen did so, well to articulate, to, to transform the relationship between students and the uh, teacher. Uh, it helps students develop deeper critical thinking and problem solving skills, as well as promotes the uh, development of, of self-confidence, uh, a sense of belonging, if you will. And uh, it ultimately helps to improve oral and written communication skills, especially as we have them built into our research experiences. So as you think about uh, course-based undergraduate research experiences, the questions that you can ask is what does research look like in your, in your discipline uh, and within your program? In other words, who participates? What are the expectations for participation? Uh, where does the support come from? What opportunities exist for uh, for everyone to get involved in research? And are you taking time to celebrate the, the process? Keep in mind as well that UNCG hosts the annual Carolyn and Norwood Thomas Undergraduate Research and Creativity Expo each spring. We're currently accepting um, abstracts for this year's program, which will be hosted on uh, April 14th. An abstract deadline is February 23rd. And course-based undergraduate research experiences are certainly accepted uh, as part of the expo. Um, it's a really great opportunity for the students to, to practice presenting the results of their inquiry. So um, course-based undergraduate research experiences, um, what are these? So research is, is embedded into the course or the curriculum. That's, that's one of the key uh, forms. All students 
have the opportunity to engage in the research project as opposed to those who were handpicked to, uh, to work in a faculty mentored, traditional mentor, mentee, or apprentice um, type of situation. Students get to work collaboratively on the project, promoting teamwork. Uh, they have the opportunity to um, be introduced to specific methodologies of that particular discipline as well as methodologies and approaches that are transferable across all disciplines. Um, another key characteristic of a course-based undergraduate research experience is that the outcomes are, are not known until the project is completed. Um, one of the things that I like to promote is uh, the sustainability of a course-based undergraduate research experience such that the outcomes are really never known and that data can be collected ad infinitum. Um, possibly not, but um, for a long period of time that uh, that will benefit students across multiple uh, semesters or offerings of an individual course. And they can build upon that increasing, uh, increased collection of information going through. And then the students or the outcomes, students are going to share the outcomes of, of the research in some manner, be it in class or during uh, the Thomas Undergraduate Research and Creativity Expo. So um, CURES can provide benefits for students from the first year to the senior. Of course, we're focusing on the first two years and as it helps to include or be inclusive of those students who are typically underrepresented within undergraduate research. I'm, I'm happy to say that UNCG, the, the statistics of those who are supported at least through the Undergraduate Research Scholarship and Creativity Office uh, really do a, a great job of mimicking the demographic characteristics of, of our general student population. And yet there are many students who never have the opportunity to engage in research. So building it into the class is a great way to do it so that all students have an opportunity to learn through this valuable, this high impact practice, this valuable teaching uh, approach. Um, most people aren't familiar with CURES. Uh, it, it is growing in popularity, um, but it is uh, still an area that is a discovery area. And given the attendance today, I, I think that it will remain a discovery area. And perhaps maybe those of you who are watching this uh, at a later time will, will be excited by the opportunities. And a well-designed CURE uses uh, many of the best pedagogy pedagogical and anthropological practices um, that exist. Challenges, uh, it takes time to develop a cure. Uh, it takes uh, time to be incentivized to change the way that individuals teach uh, subjects. Uh, the, the general mantra is, well, this is the way I learned, so it's good. if it was good enough for me, it's good enough for you. Well, perhaps um, we need to think about the inclusivity aspect of learning, not everyone learns equally, yet learning through discovery or discovery-based learning is something that has been shown to benefit all. It requires extensive planning and preparation. The projects must be appropriate for the level of students uh, or else there are some serious uh, problems with that. And uh, I would encourage that as you get involved in the preparation of a cure that you strongly consider developing a network of colleagues uh, with whom you can you can talk about the hits and misses of the of the cures because i can assure you that the first attempt is not going to be where you end up uh, semesters later should it be a successful uh, cure so all research starts with um, the observational aspect, uh, which leads to that. This is this is where we're getting to the nuts and bolts of cures in the first couple of years. Um, all research starts with observation, uh, which leads to understanding and development of questions. Uh, as, as Louis Pasteur stated in 1854, chance favors only the prepared mind. So observation is a skill that can be developed through guided exercises. So for example, uh, John Stilgo, uh, he's a Harvard professor of landscape history, takes students on walks and asks them to make environmental observations. 
Repeated walks along the same path encourages students to notice elements that have been previously overlooked. Here at UNCG, I've taken a group of our students to our uh, to, to the Weatherspin. And um, one of the educational uh, members of the Weatherstone staff, uh, Ann Grimaldi, leads them through an exercise where they observe the exhibits closely. And then later we divide the groups into pairs, uh, taking one of each pair to observe, for instance, a sculpture or a painting for a few minutes. And then next they, they, they get back in their pairs and the observer then describes the, the piece of art, the sculpture if it is, uh, to the other, who then makes a sketch based upon the description. It's amazing um, what the students say after that experience and, and because they don't know that they're gonna have to describe it uh, afterwards. They, they just know that they're, they're making observations. So if they knew that they were going to be describing it to their partner before they got started, then they probably would have been better prepared to observe. So then we can take them back and have them do it again. Um, or uh, the lesson is, is, is generally pretty well, well known. So many uh, uh, professors ask students to draw samples, for instance, in biology and geology classes, uh, and the drawing of, of samples then uh, helps one focus intensely on what are the key characteristics of whatever it is that they are observing. Another key aspect of a cure in the first two years is that of question. So a fellow undergraduate research director, Andrew Belke, once said that research is about the audacity of the question. The simplest of these questions is what? Uh, Matthew Bowker in 2010 uses a question-centered pedagogical approach to help students in his course understand how the answers we have come to accept. The answers that we have come to accept are connected, uh, contingent and contextual. And how uh, they rely on, imply and beg additional questions. This is accomplished through the development of analytical, reflective and open-ended questions that ask why what if and how, rather than simply what. And you all know just as well as I do that uh, many times uh, our students say, I don't wanna know how, I don't wanna know, want to know why, I just wanna know what, show me the quickest route to the answer. And uh, my common refrain has been, I can tell you what, but if I tell you how, then you're gonna be able to come up with a what later. Um, when you're faced with a similar situation. Uh, Joanne uh, Murphy has done an incredible job, and I'll let her talk about this a little bit later, um, with large section classes of 100 plus students, uh, where she helps them cultivate the ability to ask actionable questions, actionable questions. And, and Joanne, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you, I'm going to leave that there and, and ask you to talk about that a little bit later. Do you want me to get in there now, Lee? If you'd like to, go right ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so without pulling up slides, basically I have this large myth class, which is 178 uh, person students, a big lecture. And um, it's a 200 level uh, Mac gen ed class. Uh, the students are reading, uh, well, translated original Greek texts, the Odyssey, the, um, Euripidean plays, Hesiod, the beginnings of the gods. And yeah, the whole class is about stories. It's about, it's a gossip column, who did what to whom and when, and who's annoyed about it, right? What was the impact? Uh, but the readings are really hard. And um, one of the things that we try and do in the class, and this is common in most, you know, myth classes, is try and help the students do a close reading of the texts. 
but so they get a passage and then to go through it and break it down so they read it more slowly and that is kind of connected to the to the observing that lee is talking about like what is challenging in this passage and so what we try and do is move beyond just the close reading to know who's doing what to whom but asking the students to reflect on what they're finding challenging about the passage and it's interesting because some students some students find the names very challenging because they're names they've never heard of antilochus achilles this kind of stuff and others people find well what's the point of these stories they, they don't know how it connects their bigger learning technique and so we do a lot of reflection in the class on how this is helping them grow helping this helping their skills their observational skills their questioning skills their understanding skills happening but then one of the big things in the class is to try and connect these stories with things the students are deeply interested in and so i ask them to write down things they're interested in and so I was going to give the best example. Uh, one girl does political science and, uh, and gender studies, and she was really interested in um, like sex trafficking in the modern world. And uh, she is like very, you know, caught up in this debate. And so then we were like, OK, well, how could your own personal interests connect what we're doing in these stories? And she says, well, I'm looking at these stories and it seems like the way Zeus is attacking and raping women and robbing women and, and indeed a boy, this is similar to sex trafficking. And I was like, well, how could you make a research question out of that? And what would it look like? And she says, well, I could just compare them. So the most basic thing is to compare them, is to write down the components of sex trafficking in the modern world. And then in antiquity, based on the myths, what are the the main components of that and then what is the impact and so she started to kind of write this um, empty research paper a shell paper so I wasn't asking her to do any of the research I was asking her to write down how would you research this question and asking them how to research the question without forcing them to do the research really sets them up for moving forward with research and a couple of kids have worked on projects and moved forward with them from from the class so that's a large 178 person class they realize that there's more to a story than just a story they realize that there's more to just getting the grade in these gen ed classes that and they bring that energy and excitement into their the classes they're taking at the same time and their next round of classes um, in another 200 level class which is a smaller group so we can do more um, I do research scaffolded research projects, which is kind of like a cure, but it's in a group uh, setting with the students where they um, also identify their areas of interest, connect them with antiquity and a group of five or four, they break down and they work as a team how they're going to address these questions. So it's not just putting the pressure onto them like, oh, get a hypothesis by the next class. It's like, well, how are you going to actually explore this data? to give you any kind of information that you could create a hypothesis about. So it is about walking through a reflective process with students, breaking down the steps of research with them and helping them do their own research. And yes, it's a 200 level class, so that's not gonna be earth shattering, but some students have come up with brilliant papers. Like there was one group of students, uh, one was an anthropologist, one was a biologist, one was a psychologist, and one was a classics major. And they did a, pro a project in the 200 level um, Greek archeology span class over the course of that semester on the different uses of blue pigments on Crete in the Minoan period. And they use their science background, they use their psychology background, they use their classics background, their anthropology background to look where it's found, what kind of impact that could have on people, what could they be the reception. They found there was two different types of blue pigment, one being uh, very expensive and one being much cheaper. And um, so after the end of the semester, two of them then continued with this research and presented at the ERSCO in the spring. They went in more detail on the topic and it was in a really super original topic that I would never come up with. It's just not questions I can ask. And so by doing these questioning processes with the students very all in their career, they realize that their interests and their questions have value. It also gives them a greater sense of ownership and independence. And it's much more inclusive than just doing um, an individual research project with one student out of class. So that's uh, how I've done it in a big and a small class of a 200 level gen ed sections. So Lee, over to you. Thanks, Joanne. That, that was fantastic. So the questioning um, aspect of that and the, the drawing connections uh, leads to drawing connections and the ability to make connections across disparate collection of information has the potential to lead to a greater understanding 
um, conceptual uh, framing and breakthrough discoveries. Uh, making connections requires the ability to make keen observations. So we go right back to the beginning there and ask great questions with an open mind. So another UNCG professor, uh, you all, well, many of you probably know her, um, Professor Holian, who has done a, a tremendous job uh, as one of the ERSCO faculty fellows. Um, she developed a course-based undergraduate research experience wherein she divided the, the students in her art history class uh, into groups and she assigned them all the same artist, but yet different periods of that artist's life. And during the course of the semester, uh, Heather had them uh, develop actionable questions. And in the middle of the semester, uh, that, that was during the middle of the semester. And then the final portion of the semester, actual questions about the artist, you know, about a key portion of the artist's life and, and career and the evolution of the artist's work through time. Uh, and then the rest of the semester, the students focused on answering those questions and drawing connections between each group project was the final aspect of, of that particular course-based undergraduate uh, research experience. So the, the final characteristic that I'd like to highlight that's, that's really important for cures in the first two years is that of the use of evidence. And this is something that, that I think that, that many of you um, are probably quite familiar with. Uh, uh, a question that we should routinely ask our students is, what is the evidence to support your conclusions? Uh, and in fact, uh, when I, I used to be fond of giving exams that, were, that had true false uh, questions on there. And you may go, oh, wow, true, false questions. But the, one of the things that, that we would do with that, those questions was we would require the students to give, uh, give evidence for their answer. If true, why? If false, why? And it, not just because the textbook said so, but they had to dig into uh, the literature. This was a great use of an open book exam process. But there, there are other areas wherein we can, we can ask this question, what is your evidence to support your conclusions? And if we ask that on a repeated basis, then what it, what it forces the students to do is think a little bit deeper about uh, the questions and the conclusions that they're coming to, the questions they're asking and the conclusions they're coming to. And it promotes information literacy. Uh, Lee, can I just hop in there for a minute, please? Yeah, sure, go right ahead. Um, this is a hugely, like, this is the, probably the co most core component of all of this, right, is that the, the use of evidence to show your conclusions, because a lot of our students come to school, where come to university, where they've been encouraged to write response essays, or how do you feel about this essays? And the point of those essays is just to get people writing and to get over the intimidation of writing. But then what we want them to do at college is to make an argument. And a convincing argument, a compelling argument, as we all know, is something that is, sorry, I just realized I don't have my camera on. A compelling argument is something that is evidence-based where what you're saying connects strongly to the evidence that you're looking at. And you've got several of these points connected to make an overarching argument. And um, a lot of our students, when they come, they, their, their, their teachers in high school have encouraged them to write, which is brilliant, but it's not necessarily the style of writing that we need for them, or indeed the job market needs from them, or the thinking that we need from you know, critical thinking citizens. So connecting that evidence with their argument is hugely key and doing it in a small, very low stake setting of in a group discussing a myth, like what do you think of Zeus from this passage? And they say, oh, I feel like he is really arrogant. Okay, well, show me in this passage, the words and the phrases that, let to, that help you think that he's arrogant. It's not feeling that he's arrogant, it's thinking that he's arrogant. And so slowly but surely during these daily exercises, we kind of reshape the way they talk. And so they think this, 
because it's rational. They have the evidence in front of them with these lines. And then once they got those bases down, then you can grow it out, right? So then by the time they're taking the archaeology class, and they actually have to find archaeological evidence, right, which of course is the information literacy that, you know, Jenny teaches so well, uh, about like, what are what are real sources, and they have to do that assessment, why do you think this is a, a, leg, a, a credible source versus something else, so that idea of connecting every argument you're making to a piece of evidence, and to be able to articulate the connection is the absolute core ingredient of any research that we do or our students do. And so getting that in often and early frees up the pressure and the tension that they have of doing a research paper, the dreaded research paper. And when they do these dreaded research papers, if they haven't been trained, they're just writing reflections and it's not very well structured. It's not connected to a single core argument or overarching thesis statement. Um, and so I think that getting in this, getting these practices in early and often is key to a successful undergraduate career. Um, thank you, Lee. Thank you, Joanne. Um, the final thing that I would like to uh, say with respect to this, this particular slide is that the use of evidence uh, really promotes uh, information literacy. Uh, and as Joanne was just talking about, um, it, building information literacy is an important uh, part of the process that helps our students begin to support their assertions and conclusions. So literature review and annotated bibliographies help to develop that important skill. One of my colleagues at, uh, in, who's in the Penn State system, Laura Gerton, has devised what is uh, affectionately known as the CRAP test uh, to help teach students information literacy. So let's take a peek at, at that. Um, and get my slide to advance. So the CRAP test, um, yes, it is an acronym. So it has to do with currency and that currency is, you know, when was the article written uh, or updated? Of course, this more recent articles are probably more uh, accurate uh, than, than stuff that was written hundred years ago. The relevance, um, is the article's information still relevant? Uh, I guess that has to do with the currency. And um, who is the article intended for? Who, who is the intended audience? Is this something that is written for scholars or is this something that's written for general population and shows up on the internet? Uh, are, are, if you're using the internet to find it, are, are there links to other sites within the article? And if so, what types of links are they? Uh, are they going to... Are they going to other just opinion websites or are they going to a .edu uh, site? And of course, we can all point to .edu web content that may not have the relevance or the, um, or the authority that, that we would like to see. So who authored the article? Is it a person or is it a person working for an institution? I don't think institutions author articles, but quite frequently we'll see things that are authored by the institution of X, Y, or Z. And, um, and then, you know, what, what is the publication or the website's credentials? What are their credentials? How, how do you know that the author is an expert? Um, look up the author, the institution. You can do that in Google and see what others have to say about it or them. What are the site biases? Uh, and then finally, the P in crap is purpose. So why was the article published? Is it meant to persuade or to inform? Uh, is it intended for the general public, uh, scholars, first year students, or all the above? And then are there advertisements or other types of content within the site where it's published? If yes, then what purpose do those advertisements serve? The bottom line is that, um, that the crap test allows us to get to is, would you use this article as a reference? So those, uh, those are some of the things that 
that we are able to develop with respect to, uh, well, those are some of the characteristics of cures, especially in the first two years. Um, there are examples of cures within the first two years where the students are doing a little more than learning research skills, yet those research skills are so important. So what are the goals that you have for the students in your program? And you know, what do you want the students to be able to do, uh, particularly in terms of uh, abilities uh, and, and skills after they graduate, by the time they graduate? What are some of the potential solutions to the challenges that we face as educators? So with that, I'm gonna hurry through this next section because I, I don't wanna to dwell too much on it, but research skills development is, uh, is something that was, that was put forth by my colleague, John Willison at the University of Adelaide. And sorry, I've, I've gone backwards on my slides here. Here we go. So uh, this, you can, you can find references to research skills development if you were to Google John Willison. Uh, University of Adelaide or just research skills development uh, framework and you'll come up with this table. You can also come to my office or send me an email lee.phillips at uncg.edu uh, and I can send you a link to this which you should be able to find it. So this is a, uh, a, a very complicated uh, diagram that gets rather simple when you begin to read it in the in the way that it's intended to be read. So let's take a, a quick look at that. I guess it's not allowing me to use the, the zoom in function that I normally have here. But uh, so you can see to embark and clarify is the first thing. And then across the, the top row of this are the levels of, of expertise. So you begin at the beginning with the first two years there, the red and the orange columns are representative of the first two years of undergraduate. And then once you get to the green, then you're really looking at um, the masters or even the early doctoral years. And then certainly when you get out to the farthest edge in the, in the purples, then, then you're looking at what, uh, what would be expected of, of you as an academic professional, and as, a, as a scholar within the discipline. So the basic ways to, to focus uh, or to develop those research skills or to break them down uh, into the simple skill sets uh, and focus on explanation and examples. And then you, you teach discipline specific skill sets and you stress the transferable nature of these, uh, provide assignments that help to reinforce the, uh, the, the development of that skill set, and you provide feedback on those assignments that will help the student develop those skill sets uh, further. Uh, another really great uh, attribute to provide is that of, um, of, of an assessment rubric for the student, helping them understand what they're getting involved in before they get involved in it and how they will be evaluated through that process. And I'm looking at the time here. It is uh, 1225. I, you know, I think that many of us know curricular design, especially uh, backward design fairly well. Uh, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this either, but just identify what it is that you want the students to know and how are ways to teach them and then build toward these goals. So starting at the end and working back to the beginning, to the beginning um, allows us to introduce content rich uh, experiences within our courses that will help to uh, promote student learning through that. We can introduce the research and query exposure elements early and then have them, um, as I'm kind of quoting Joanne here, rinse and repeat. So they um, get better, uh, better experiences uh, and better opportunities to go through this. One bit of advice would be to go slow 
uh, these types of changes are, <clears throat> they need to be intentional and brought about with consensus of instructors within, within your program area. Uh, and it's, it's best to think about how you're gonna hand off a class uh, and those research skills to the next professor that the student is going to be exposed to. So build in the skills you wanna cultivate. This is where we would ask you all, you know, such as what? So some short-term research projects, creative projects that go beyond the research paper or cookbook operations. <clears throat> so that can be the cures. Individual small group projects are really great. And then uh, interest at, at the appropriate level. The assignments might include reading primary literature, application of comparative literature, uh, which I think is a great way to go about doing this, essays, um, as well as presenting the results of that inquiry, uh, working with data, you know, how, how, do, how do we plot a presentation? What are the best ways to illustrate this, uh, the data sets, that, the variable data sets that we're able to acquire? Uh, basic practice experiences that, so a community-based research project can help uh, really get students excited about learning uh, and giving back to a community. And then many times we have imperial cool research projects where students are going out and counting insects on a grid, um, maybe at one of the uh, wetlands that we've installed on our campus. And this is just a, a little summary of, of um, putting the research in the first, second, and third years, not just for upper level classes. And then the thing I would like to highlight here is that uh, we should work iteratively and provide frequent and meaningful feedback uh, to our students, which allows them to progress through the development of those research skills uh, that are so important. Students who've been involved in this type of activities uh, report <clears throat> that they are more satisfied with their educational process. Um, individually mentored research experiences, uh, the potential uh, have, so course-based experiences have the potential to be on par with individually mentored research experiences. And with that, I am going to close and uh, invite a little bit more conversation. Lee and Joanne, um, I found this especially helpful as someone who um, works with curricular design and teaching mostly first and second year students, thinking about the ways that cures can be incorporated into any of the competencies that are part of MAC. Um, but my question for the two of you is thinking about our, our campus as a whole and our new gen ed program, which is not sequential, but does have a foundations course, which theoretically students would take mostly in the first semester, possibly in that second semester. Um, it, which also includes information literacy, the student learning outcomes. Thinking about that foundations competency and the many ways it might look on campus, in your ideal scenario, what would CURES look like in a foundations course? I'll, I'll take it. Um, I think that in the foundation course, like Lee said, I think that if we were able to get our faculty, I mean, I think our faculty are trying to like get meet the competencies to integrate cures. I think in the foundation course, the 100 level class, getting them to ask questions, getting them to understand that research is question and inquiry and just curiosity driven, like what interests you? What, what's passion? What are you doing in this classroom, right? And being able to articulate that and reflect on that. 
I mean, you can make um, kind of research skills development in your class, or you can then have a bit more impact with a cure. So the students have a finished product that they share in some way, either with their class or preferably with a larger group. And we have in the past have had uh, 100, 200 level classes, mainly from the residential colleges, like we've some great groups where the whole class come and present at the expo, right? The Underwood Expo in, um, in April. Um, so I think that starting, as Lee said, with the observation and question and evidence-based conversations with the students in those very low level classes, I think signals a break between us wanting you to reflect and give us your opinion on what you feel about this to, no, 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 we want you actively thinking and weighing up this data and we want you weighing up what is proper data, what is credible data. So I think if you're, you know, pushing the information literacy, but having a product at the end so the students are tying things together in the early max. I think in the department level, um, we all, each department has a huge amount of max, right? And um, if we had the undergraduate research skill development and the cures scaffolded through our curriculum, then we as a department would know what classes the students are getting the skills in. We could in our advising ask kids, where do you think you're lacking? What skills are you lacking? Uh, I don't really know what good data is, Dr. Murphy. I just don't know how to find it. Okay, well then you should take this class. It's exactly what that professor does in that class. Or I have a problem, I have a problem presenting and I haven't had much opportunity. Okay, well, talk to Murphy as a lunatic about presenting. She loves it, you know? So, and so that way we can encourage our classes, our students to go to the classes that have the skills built in because you can't do all things in all classes. That's you know, that's an immature uh, idea that we all got knocked out of us in grad school, right? And so I think the more focused and deliberate and Lee's favorite word, of course, is intentional. The more intentional you are and explicit about the skills that you want the students to get, the more impactful you will be. Does that answer it? Yeah, I think you did think nailed it there, Joanne. Um, you know, it requires us to be creative too. Yet keeping, I mean, I. We boil it down to the simplest four elements. And so just to re-highlight what Joanne just said, observations, questions, connecting, connecting different things from within the discipline and outside the discipline, and then the use of evidence. Those four things, we can do that in virtually any class. And we can do it and have students learn. We can have students engage in this process and learn the content that we're meant to teach during that. So it, it takes, it really, you know, putting one of these things together takes a lot of thought, but ultimately the student then becomes more in charge of their education and owning their education through the process. And many of the students are gonna push back and like, no, 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 just tell me, remember, they're gonna say, just tell me what I need to know. Now, we're gonna ask you to go through this process yourself and learn what, by asking why and how and when and wherefore. So the, this, is, this is the process we're in, uh, aspect of things. I agree. I think the engagement and ownership are key components from the student's perspective. Um, I think that it is really hard for students, for everybody, right? Everybody, we were students, right? It's very hard for humans to let go of that safety of knowing, right? My whole life, the proper thing to do has been to let you tell me what to do and then I'll just do it. Great, I will just do it. I've excelled at this. I've worked myself silly trying to excel at doing what you, the person in, in charge, wants me to do. And now we're really flipping that paradigm, which of course, as Lee said, is going to give backlash because we're demanding that they're more engaged and we're taking more ownership and yeah that engagement might be like great like if you're at the archives and you can touch things you can feel things. i don't have any artifacts for students to touch or feel here on campus right but um they can be engaged in just basic research projects where they are deciding the question like it's really hard for students to decide whether their research has any interest or if they're interested in this topic, would anybody else be interested in this topic? And, and will the teacher like it? It's like, forget about that. And that's very hard to change that paradigm for everybody. And we all go through it. And so the sooner the better we can help our students uh, basically own their education. It's hard, it's a hard process for all of us. 
But the sooner the better we can do that, the stronger our student body is going to be and the greater impact it has on their education and on them moving forward. And again, the inclusivity is key. The inclusivity is so important and it's so in line with our um, university mission. We want this education available to everybody. So I'm um, doing it in our classes and especially in our lower level gen ed where everybody is starting from scratch is definitely the place to bring it in. You don't want to bring it in in 300 level classes where kids who have been marginalized, uh, who have felt marginalized, who are aware of being marginalized, now go into a 300 level class where these other kids now know another skill that they don't have. And so by making it very open access in our early, um, our gen ed program, it's telling everyone, look, nobody knows what I'm talking about today, okay? It's all equal, nobody knows. And, um, and so they can get behind that. It's like, okay, well, nobody knows. Okay, great, then, because I don't know. And, and, and so it helps, them, it helps them get into it and ownership and create community with them, with their other students, so. Thanks for that question, Jennifer. It's a really good question. Um, I was wondering if you could expand on the inclusivity. Um, so like when Karen was talking about her, you know, project and one of the big issues in order for that project to even be accessible is it had to be embedded in the course because people have different calls on their time. We, you know, we often expect our students to like live here and be able to go to the library at a moment's notice. So, um, you know, the positioning of those research skills in the curriculum, in the department, in the, in the sort of curricular imagination of the department is one barrier. Uh, within courses themselves, I'm wondering, from your all's perspective, what are some common barriers to inclusivity uh, once you're starting a cure inside the course? I think, um, well, the, the barriers to like the call on people's times, when people leave the classroom, our students are not all on you know, fully funded rides at college, either from the university or from their family, right? So many of them have jobs. Many of them are married. Many of them have children. Many of them have responsibilities that we don't envision when we're looking at a canonical age, traditional age student in a classroom of 19. Our students, some of them are facing great demands when they leave our classroom, right? And so doing more of the process in the class means that more of the process is accessible to them. And um, so that's, that, that is the huge barrier. We don't know what's going on outside. We also, by doing it in the classroom, it kind of, it, it somehow rather helps stop people's internal monologue of, I don't belong here, I can't do this, right? Because when you're on your own outside, and this again happens to everybody, right? But the problem is that when it's happening to you, you feel like you're the only one that feels like they don't belong, right? But if you're outside the classroom, you have already got all these time demands, but somewhere whether you've carved out a half an hour to do this research on Greek archeology span that you've been asked to do by your professor, right? And you're trying to find it and it's hard. And you think now it's hard because it's you, because you're not prepared for this. You're not able for this. You haven't been trained for this. You don't have the intellectual capacity for it, right? But if they're doing some of that in the classroom, they realize that the other kids are having the same difficulty as well. So yes, it's about time constraints and trying to bring them together in a classroom. It's about allowing deep project time in the classroom, where the either in class with the professor or giving a class time, maybe one or two a semester, where the student groups can meet on their own. So they all have a time. There's no way they can say, I can't meet, right? Because they can set up a Google Doc in that time. But it also helps them mentally be aware that other people's other people find this hard too. And that is a huge inclusivity issue. And there's a lot of, you know, um, a lot of uh, research coming out now about how many students leave college because they feel they don't belong. And when you get down to the basis of it, they feel they don't belong because it's not coming easily to them. And, and but we need to tell them it's not coming easily to anybody. Like my research doesn't come easily to me, right? Getting out of this class doesn't come easily. And kind of being able to withstand that, to build that resilience, to let them know that that difficulty is okay, is a huge point of inclusivity. Yeah, inclusivity is such an important uh, aspect of, um, is such an important 
thing for us to consider as educators uh, and in helping students develop that, cultivate that sense of belonging in the class. Uh, I frequently, with a presentation like this, would have a, a little section on transparent assignment design as, as um, it's about last year, we had Marianne Winkleman uh, join us for one of our HIPS brown bags, you may recall. And within that, uh, those efforts that she and her colleagues uh, worked towards were uh, specifically aimed at promoting a sense of belonging, especially among first and second year students. And the transparent assignment design, and this is something that can be done with a cure, is you know, basically it has three ingredients and that is to be clear on the purpose of the exercise. In other words, you know, why are you doing this? What skills are you trying to develop and cultivate within the student? It's not just an exercise. It's not just busy work because when it's perceived as an exercise that's busy work, then there's a lack of interest in following through. Hey, we all have that experience too, right? Like annual reports, busy work. Sorry. I'm, this is being recorded and I just said that, but yet, I mean, there is importance with the annual reports that we put in. I'm glad that Jenny's smiling. Um, there's importance with, the, with the, the work that we put in, but if we understand why we're putting that work in, it makes it more uh, palatable. And then the second thing is, what are the steps ne necessary in order to complete this assignment? And with a course based with a cure, we can articulate the steps. You know, what are the things that you need to do in order to do this successfully? And then finally, how are you going to be assessed? And that assessment model then helps the student look at the assignment and understand how they're going to work to best satisfy uh, the assignment, but ultimately how they're gonna learn the most through that process, I think. And then I, I said it, three times during the presentation, so I'll say it one more time. Another key component is frequent and meaningful feedback. We can't just let the students keep going on their own. We have to have checkpoints to make sure that they're doing what they're meant to be doing. And that amazingly, I mean, it, it really helps the students stay on task and helps them understand and, and re reminds them why they're doing what they're doing. Thanks, Vaughn. Great question. Joanne? I'm writing that down. <laughs> it's a good I'm summary. <laughs> What's that? It's a good summary of all the important points. <laughs> it is. So I'm going to ask you, can I ask you to, um, to just talk for, you know, three or four minutes about the Faculty Fellows Program? Uh, through the ERSCO, and uh, and that might be a good wrap-up point for us for today. Well, as you know, Lee is the undergraduate research director, the director of the ERSCO, and has done Herculean work to get more and more faculty involved with a view to getting more and more students involved. And one component of this program is to build up a faculty fellow program. And the goal of the faculty fellows program over the last few years has been to um, uh, give help give financial support a thousand dollars usually per class for a faculty member to redesign a course to integrate a cure into that course to participate in our workshops to contribute to the workshops and to share their experiences with their department heavily with their department and their immediate colleagues but also their other friends and colleagues that are faculty on campus to try and spread spread the good news so we've had uh, we've had years where we have focused on the humanities where because we were lining up for a Mellon grant that we knew that was very focused on the humanities. So we wanted to get some early faculty kind of early adopters in there. Uh, we have uh, brought faculty, the faculty fellows to um, Council of Undergraduate Research um, conferences where you discuss with other faculty from around the country about how to integrate undergraduate research um, into your curriculum in a diverse way, you can do that on your campus. And um, currently we have two um, undergraduate research fellows and one is in uh, classical studies who's going to redesign a myth class and help the students do a, um, a cure individ individual project. 
and we have um, another faculty who are in um, communications and um, that's not right I the library and human development and family studies I believe human development. and so it is more open course the curriculum uh, we are opening up, we have a new call for, pay, for our proposals that has just gone out for um, summer funding. So we want to give two more research faculty money to design, redesign a class they will teach in the fall, but they will redesign over the summer and um, to see if that kind of time helps them free up some time over the summer for them. So the faculty fellows program has probably around maybe 12 fellows um, connected to it now. We had something like 60 faculty redesign courses in the humanities in um, for the Mellon grant. Um, we've also had faculty work on research projects in the humanities with undergraduate uh, researchers, and we've had around 10 of them. So overall, around 80 faculty have been impacted directly by the undergraduate research fellows or by us implementing it in subsections on the campus. Um, there's also in the uh, biology and chemistry department, they have um, faculty employed designated to help people integrate cures. So that's another whole section of our faculty um, being trained in this. So uh, several departments like LLC and anthropology have heavily ad ad adopted the scaffolding of undergraduate research throughout their, through their curriculum and can articulate what classes they are um, learning what skills in. And um, we really feel like that this is what well, we feel this. We do emotionally feel this is a positive thing, but we also think this and know this from the data, right? That shows us that the high impact, the positive impact this has on student success here and afterwards. And it's a social mobility, right? So my end goal is social mobility. I want students to be able to move up the socioeconomic ladder. I want them to be, feel content and safe and financially secure when they finish college. I want them to know their college degree, they money, the money and the resources of time and emotional commitment that they spent on it was really worth it when they're done. And I think that um, undergraduate research is the absolute miracle sauce in this um, component, like added on top of already the great education that students are getting at UNCG. Because um, unlike most other schools, we have an increasingly um, an increasing percentage of under, traditionally underrepresented groups on our campus, in our faculty, in our, in our student body, and indeed in our faculty, but much less so in the faculty. And so our impact, our, our impact real and potential is huge at UNCG for how we can move the needle on uh, student success, post-graduation success. But we need to be integrating high impact practices during the student's career at university to make that really happen. And so whether the high impact is undergraduate research study abroad, internships, we need to bring more of them to the table, but the most accessible one is a cure in your class often and early. Thank you. Thanks, Joanne. Well, with that, I think that we will close this session. Uh, so I will thank you very much for taking the time to listen to this recording and be a part of this uh, today. Uh, if you have questions, um, please don't hesitate to get in touch with either Joanne or me, hopefully both of us. Um, it's, it's better to have an audience if you're brainstorming, and we're more than happy to, to work with you to brainstorm ideas to transform the way you teach our students at UNCG. We have some upcoming workshops. Lee. We do have some up, yeah. So check out the ERSCO for faculty webpage, and you can see the upcoming workshops uh, listed there and the dates and how to connect. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Wonderful. Thanks, Lee. That was great.